Likewise. Yeah. All right. Well, I got six o'clock straight up. So uh, let's call to order the city council work session for November 16th, 2020. Uh, roll call, please, Sue. Uh, Councillor Cofield. Present. Councillor Yarnell Holloman. Here. Councillor Martinez Plancarte. Present. Uh, Mayor Rogers. Present. Councillor Bacon. Here. Councillor Finley. And Doug's going to take plan yeah. commission roll. Jason, you want to call your uh, meeting? Yeah. Order? I, I'll do it, Mayor. Jason Dale. Here. Uh, Robert Sherry. Here. Robert Ficker. Jenna Morris. Here. Chris Wright. Sharon Capri. Jeffrey Musil. And Colin Bullock. Here. Back over to you, Mayor. All right, great, thank you. All right, welcome planning uh, commissioners and planning chair again, welcome. Thank All you. All right, uh, review of the council agenda and meeting folks for the business session. Any uh, comments or suggestions? Mayor, uh, I, I'd like to talk about um, SDC funds or fees, please. SDC fees. Okay, we'll bring it up at uh, during council business. All right, um, and then um, and then I'd like to just I'd like to suggest that we move uh, public hearing nine A to actually follow um, the continued business, which is ten, items ten A, B, and C. If we could. All right, everybody okay with that, and with SDC fees. All right, hearing no no objections. All right, uh, Matt, looks like on to you with business items, the September 2020 fund financial statements. All right, folks, if you have any questions, Matt is here waiting your questions. This is the most exciting part of the evening, so I mean, don't hold back. Well, we're waiting, we're waiting for November numbers, Matt. Then we'll know where we where where we are, or better where we are, maybe. Well, I will refer you back to the I think it was August uh, presentation where where I did give an update at least on the tax assessed value uh, that was levied. I mean, the good news there was that we expect to get maybe fifty thousand dollars more uh, just due to higher valuation than we anticipated, just slightly. But uh, that was good news. Now that now it's just a matter of collections. Uh, just collecting taxes there it is all right all right any other questions for matt folks not hearing any no all right so let's move on to the 5a the work session on transportation system plan technical upgrade to implement the riverfront master plan and we'll turn it over to doug and to shannon i believe no mayor on the tsp we're going to turn this over to brett music who's actually managing the project brett yes yes good evening counselors and commissioners so we're here to present the Matt Bell with Kittleson Associates going to give you a presentation on where we're at on the transportation system plan update. And this is related to the riverfront master plan that was accepted. And now we're in the implementation phase of that. So we're updating all of the master plans, including the transportation. So this is where we'll give you what's happening so far with what we've, what Kittleson has been working on to date and what the next steps are from there. So with that, I'll give it over to turn it over to Matt Bell. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I was just trying to find my mute key here. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Matt Bell, and I'm with Kittleson and Associates. I've been supporting Brett, Doug, and Karin and others on um, an update to the transportation system plan. This is a technical update, um, so we're really focused in just a few particular areas that we're going to go over a little bit tonight. Uh, next slide. So just by way of a quick agenda, we have a, a relatively brief presentation, really want to save some time here at the end for any questions you guys might have. But I'm, I'm going to, um, a couple of these slides we may have, you may have seen during our, during our last presentation, or at least the planning commissioners saw during our last presentation. 
just to talk a little bit about what is a TSP and why is it being updated. Then we're going to get into some of the key recommendations for consideration for the TSP update. Talk a little bit about next steps and open it up for questions. Next slide. So first, um, why do we have a TSP update? So first, the, the, um, the TSP is a multimodal plan. It outlines future projects, programs, policies for walking, cycling, driving, and taking transit both within and to the city. It's also a long-term plan. It supports the city's anticipated growth in jobs and housing in different areas throughout the community over the next 15 years. It's actually, that's the, um, the horizon is, I believe this is a 2035. So typically TSPs can go out 20 years and this one, we're just recognizing the next 15 years for this particular update. The TSP is a guiding document. It helps the city with decisions related to land use actions and transportation funding priorities. And finally, it identifies, identifies the necessary funding for, um, for various improvement projects helps the city work with other agencies to seek funding opportunities for changes, updates, and improvements to the transportation system. Next slide. So why are we updating the TSP? So primarily to incorporate the policies and recommendations in the Riverfront Master Plan. So we wanna support the changes in land use anticipated in the Riverfront <clears throat> Master Plan, excuse me, such as the new residential, commercial, and or retail uh, properties. We want to add sidewalk, trail, bike lane, and street projects identified in the Riverfront Master Plan area. These are um, including primarily supporting access to and from the area as well as within the area. And then finally identify the needed funding for additional Riverfront projects. So part of our project involves updating the cost estimates associated with all of the plan improvements within the Riverfront area. Next slide. So what area is actually included in the update? So you guys might be familiar with this map. This map can, comes to you out of your Riverfront master plan. It's um, primarily focused in, on, the, on the facilities that do provide access to and within that area. And so that's kind of the focus of, our, of, our, of the update. Next slide. So what are the recommended projects to support walking? Um, there are several planned improvements in the TSP that support walking to and from the Riverfront area. The Riverfront Master Plan includes a few new paths and sidewalks to connect people with between and within the Riverfront area to jobs, schools, parks, and houses. Um, some of the key projects in, in the Riverfront Master Plan that would be incorporated into the TSP include an Esplanade walking path, a bypass trail extension from South River Street over to College Street, and then finally a Rogers Landing Road Trail. So these are these are projects that are kind of split between the pedestrian and the, um, and the bypass related projects in the TSP. And primarily, as you can see, really focus a lot on, on, on the new trail connections. These types of facilities, um, bicycle or these types of facilities uh, are particularly important for folks that are some of the transportation disadvantaged folks that rely on walking and biking to get around. Um, get around the community and, and have a tendency to get um, to really, really be able to enhance, augment, support the, otherwise the street network that provides some of those same access. Finally, one of the other projects we'll talk, we'll, um, I'm sure you've heard about at this point, is the future feasibility study of uh, trolley to and from the downtown area. Next slide. So this is just a quick slide or map of the Riverfront Master Plan area with the additional uh, pedestrian project. This is the Esplanade project that I just referred to a moment ago. The other two projects that were shown previously are actually, again, part of the, the bypass related projects. So they're not shown on this map, but this shows how the new project is, um, is sort of tied in with the other plan improvements identified in the TSP. Next slide. So what are the recommended projects to support people riding bikes? So similar to the, similar to the, to the um, walking related projects, there are a number of um, bicycle projects in the TSP that are intended to improve access to and from the riverfront area, um, as, as well as a handful of projects within the riverfront area that help uh, to circulate uh, for, from the bicyclists, for bicyclists. 
some of those changes really result in some key changes along um, specific roadways, such as the river, such as River Street, north and south of the bypass. The Riverfront Master Plan identifies a, a number of different options for improving River Street, and um, ultimately, this project will identify a preferred option that will be incorporated in the TSP. Also identifies potential improvements as shown there on um, South Winooski and South College Street. Next slide. And this is this is another uh, a slide of the plan improvements within the Riverfront Master Plan that will ultimately be incorporated in the TSP. The ones that are highlighted there in green are the are the new projects. Uh, all the other projects are um, ones that are existing for the TSP. And hopefully I get this right, but the dark red ones are the likely to be funded and the, um, the orange dash colored ones are the aspirational. And I should have I should have mentioned this before that all the projects that are being incorporated into the TSP from the Riverfront Master Plan are coming in as likely to be funded. So we can touch on that here in a moment. Right, next slide. So what new streets and intersection changes are being recommended? So there are changes to provide additional connections into and within the riverfront area, as well as support rail crossing safety. So we talked a lot about the walking and the biking improvements. There are some street connectivity improvements as well. So the um, key street projects that are identified as an a extension of Blaine Street, extension of Rogers Landing Road, um, further to the southeast there. Rail crossings and equipment on College and River Street, new signals at Blaine, Hancock, Blaine First and downtown area and a long-term study, <clears throat> pardon me, to identify the future needs of East 14th, Roger Landing Road, Bluff Street. This is that um, kind of the, the intersection there at the so southern end of, um, of River Road that provides access to all these other um, streets, sorry. Uh, next slide. So this is showing the new street and intersection related projects. Again, the ones that are shown in green are the, are the new projects. The dark orange ones are likely to be funded and the orange dash ones are aspirational. Uh, next slide. So what are, the, what are the next steps? So we plan to confirm the list of recommended projects. And so we have shared, we have shared some documentation of, the, of what will be incorporated into the TSP from the Riverfront Master Plan includes a table with the specific projects and the specific action items related to each of those projects, whether it's changing ex an existing project from aspirational to likely to be funded, incorporating a, a new project, and, um, and as I mentioned before, ultimately updating the costs associated with all of those projects, pending any comments from you guys. As, it, as it's shown here, preliminary costs indicate that adding projects will increase the likely to be funded from 54.5 to 73 million over 15 years. Um, can we, some of the things that we definitely need to consider when we make that kind of a change is the implications of the additional cost um, on STCs. I heard somebody mention just a moment ago wanting to talk a little bit about STCs. So um, STCs, obviously the city collects those as part of a development projects to, to, um, to fund any improvements in the city that provide additional capacity to accommodate the, that growth. So uh, obviously it's an important component of this project as well. So our, and finally, our, our, our next meeting would be with the Planning Commission in January to talk a little bit more about the, the actual TSP update and um, I think that's, yeah, that's my last slide. Any questions? All right, folks, questions. Let's uh, see if I can figure out where the hands up is. Where's the hands up? There it is. Uh, not seeing any. I'll, uh, I'll start then. Uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, Brett, thank you. Um, can you explain, I guess, and this back to the SDCs, can you all explain the relationship uh, or if there is a relationship, not just for us, but for the audience, um, the relationship between SDC rates for transportation and this TSP. I could take a shot at that, Brett, but I'm kind of looking at you there. Yeah, no, you the spot. correct. So basically with the, we currently have system development charges for transportation based upon the projects in the current TSP. One of the issues that we've identified is with these additional projects, we're increasing what that total dollar amount of projects are. 
So there's two approaches, and that's kind of what the question that we had had posing is here. Do we move forward with adding the projects into the list without increasing the SDC, without changing them, which would lead to an network expected to lead to an increase in that SDC? And if we do that, then we're making that changes, and there's a process for that piece of it. If we add the projects in, we'll just recognize that we're not going to fund everything with the SDCs that we're currently collecting within that time frame. We would adjust those projects. So hopefully that helps to answer that question somewhat, Mayor. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think for everybody, for, for the council particularly, um, remember the SDCs are based on a, a block of projects that are put in the queue. Um, and that is essential. And I, this took me a long time to figure this out, but that's, in, that's very important um, to the dollar value that we are charging people to either start or move a business in this community. And I think this is what Denise is, will be at talking about later in the evening. The other question becomes, is I know there was just a list sent out to the Urban Renewal Committee regarding projects such as this. So the question now, I guess, probably for Doug is, what is the relationship between these TSP projects and Urban Renewal? Thank you, oh, thank you Mayor. So Doug Rex is the ad hoc committee for the Urban Renewal Program is currently evaluating a project list. That project list is between 115 million to 117 million dollars. And that includes improvements both in the downtown area, in the riverfront area, and then the two connecting streets, Blaine Street and River Street. Um, the committee at their last meeting, which was a week ago, uh, was looking at the growth rate. And so if you remember back when we were presenting the feasibility study, we ran a four, five, six, and 7% growth rate. Uh, the committee was looking and discussing a growth rate uh, between six and 7%. Uh, they did not fix on a specific number. What they said is they wanted to go through and look at the list of projects and looking at those list of projects is which projects would leverage private development, create new jobs, and then there are projects that are more community enhancement related. So they're going through an exercise right now and they have information to get to me Thursday by end of business day and I will compile all that and we're meeting again next week. So uh, as Matt was going through this and looking like River Street and improvements, that potentially could be an urban renewal project. Blaine Street extension from 9th to College Street, that could be an urban renewal project. Uh, the portion or some portion of urban renewal. Wynuski Street as another example from 9th Street to 11th Street could potentially be another urban renewal project to fund or to partially fund. So urban renewal dollars could be another funding source for this additional, Matt, what was it, 20, 24 million, $22 million? Might be another funding source. Thing to keep in mind is at a 6% growth rate, we're looking at a little over $53 million of potential capacity in 2020 dollars. A 7% growth rate is about 71 million. Uh, and so right now the committee's got a lot of heavy lifting to try to figure out what those projects could be. That help, Mayor? Yeah, it does. I, I guess the, part of the question though becomes is, you know, when we say that the, the projects that are listed as dark orange are likely to be funded, uh, I'm not sure what that means in, because if Urban Renewal hasn't decided that. Uh, maybe I wasn't following. Yeah, so those are basically the projects that we anticipate in being incorporated into a CIP, a capital improvement program within the elements. They're things that look like they are reasonable to accomplish, more reasonable than, say, an aspirational project that's there's more unknowns or there's a greater risk associated with identifying what the costs are behind those. When you, when you, sorry to follow on again, would you, when you come back to us, will you, will you explain to us what this increase in project? will do to the transportation SDCs? Well, I, that's part of what the question is, is we are looking for a direction. Do we move forward with that aspect to identify that and capture that piece of it? Or do we stay with where we're at and just add the projects into the component? Now, once we look at it, and I, I guess that doesn't necessarily mean that you move forward with it, raising those or changing that SDC, depending on what that outcome is. Well, I guess to, to partially, or at least for me, Will we know by the time we hear from you again what the, yeah, I guess we will, what the urban renewal folks have suggested? 
because because if we're going to it'll make a big difference as to whether this this goes through through SDCs or through urban renewal, right? Won't that make a difference as to the impact? Well, it depends on how the outcome is with the and correct me if I go astray here. Um, as far as the urban renewal, there could be a proportionality of dollars going to a project. So there could be a project that's SDC eligible and gets SD partly funded by SDCs and partly funded through the urban renewal piece of it. It, it can get complicated as I'm learning. And then, this is Doug Rux again. So Brett's correct. And the work that the committee, urban renewal committee is doing, we provided them data and potential other funding sources for projects, some of that list is transportation. So some of it could be SDC, some of it could be some grant money from someplace else, some of it could be urban renewal funds, uh, some of it could be developer driven. And so that's where Brett says it gets a little bit complicated on the methodology. Um, but I think the question really for this evening is, you know, if we add these likely to be funded projects, do you want us to go through and because there's a process, there's a 90 day notification and a 60 day notification process that we have to do and start running those numbers. For the urban renewal side, the hope is, is that when we get into January of 2021, we will have refined that list of projects that we think we could fund with urban renewal. Um, there's still a plan and a report to prepare. The TSP is scheduled to come back for you, to you at a public hearing in February of 2021. So there's a little bit of a timing issue there, Mayor, but we're trying to work all these numbers to figure out how we, can, how we can address the improvements. The other component of this is if you take and would assume, this is another variable, that these likely to be funded transportation, do we then remove 22 roughly million dollars of other transportation projects and put the riverfront projects in? So those are choices as the policymakers that you're going to get to make. Um, and, and does this, and you said this goes to the planning commission, Hi, planning commissioners greetings. Does this go to them <laughs> first and then back to us or, or how does this work? Yes, it goes to the planning commission as okay. a legislative hearing on January 14th. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll stop yakking. Anybody else, anybody else raise a hand and I think I can see you. Um, you know, okay, well, hearing nothing, the only thing, and I don't want to, I don't want to steal Denise's I, thunder. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I have a question. Fire away. So I, yeah, it. I'm just curious with um, these projects, are any of, do any of them have the option to adding purple pipe when you go in and do these for any of the landscaping needs around them, or is the infrastructure already there and that's not an option for these? Yeah, um, go ahead, Brett. I was going to say that this is related to the transportation project. So that's, uh, we'd have to look at that as far as how the feasibility probably under of bringing the purple pipe over to those areas because we need to get across from, from the uh, treatment plant and where that's at. Councillor, it's a, it's a relatively short run to get from the wastewater plant uh, up Wynewski to at least get to the riverfront area. Then the next discussion is depending on the development pattern, and we don't know what that's gonna look like yet, where would you run that purple pipe? Um, Cause you're probably looking at places that are landscaping. Uh, we've talked in the master plan about a linear park underneath the bridge for the bypass. That could be a potential to irrigate that. Uh, that's another bigger, longer term conversation with ODOT to do that possibility. Then we've also talked about uh, the old landfill and that becoming a, a, a large park, about a 37, 38 acre park. That might be another opportunity to extend purple pipe, which would be part of the wastewater system out down waterfront street in order to serve that property. All right, uh, all right Colin. So uh, we are looking at gathering funds. So I'm wondering if it's possible as we're ordering or as we're looking at what is likely to be funded, what is not likely to be funded, uh, what is aspirational, is it possible within that likely to be funded category to look at, uh, is there a way we can organize these priorities in a sense that will make our use of funds more efficient and will prioritize what needs to be accomplished first?
I'm happy to take a shot at that. Hey, Matt, <laughs> I saw you on the criteria for that related yeah. to that piece of it. So if you could please. Yeah. So so for now, one of the things that we've been doing is really just looking at the overall costs and the overall impacts to the TSP or to the city when we incorporate these projects. We haven't necessarily started talking about priorities yet, but one of the one of the first times that we we met and talked, we we talked about the um, what the current goals and policies are of the TSP, what sort of evaluation criteria they used as a basis to prioritize their projects into the likely to be funded and into the um, aspirational project list. And so that is a process that we can certainly revisit as part of this. If, if like one of the thing, one of the options that Brett laid out was to potentially shift some of the stuff in the, in the likely to be funded list into the aspirational list in order to accommodate those projects. So that is definitely an exercise that we could go through if that was the option that you wanted us to take. We have, um, in short, we have the um, we have the information necessary to go through that process. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm just thinking if instead of going all for all or nothing for what's on the likely list currently, it may be more uh, practical to approach it on a criteria basis. Yeah. So this is Doug again. So one of the things about taking something as we presented it this evening as a, as a likely to be funded and moving it to an aspirational, then you theoretically, if the urban renewal program moves forward and gets adopted, there could be another step to come back and adjust the TSP and take projects that are in the aspirational and move them into the likely to be funded category. And I guess I should clarify because I keep throwing a number out of 22 million. The delta difference between what we got and what's in the proposal is 18.5. All right. Other comments or questions, folks? Okay. I'll just I'll just make a a broad comment. And again, not to steal Denise's thunder for later on in the evening, but um, I would just like to say that that SD the SDC pool is not an unlimited resource to tap. We can only jack them up so much before it starts to hinder businesses either coming to town or relocating in town. So I think we have to be very, very careful as to how much we add to this, particularly um, if we know that it's coming from urban renewal or likely from other sources, ODOT or whomever, great. But if it's just SDC based, I think we've got to be, move very cautiously. That's my, uh, my two cents. All right, anything else, folks? All right, hearing, hearing none. Thank you, uh, planning commissioners. Matt, thank you very much for your presentation. Brett, thank you for the presentation. Planning commissioners, feel free to join us anytime. We do this twice a month. So you, can, you can just tune in. Uh, feel free. We'd love to have you. Otherwise, and also, Thank you for all that you do. We don't thank you nearly enough because you guys do a lot of the nitty gritty uh, down in the depths of it work. So we really, we really can't thank you. So um, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. All right. Um, let's counselors. It looks like we got a couple of ticks before next go. So uh, Dan, you want to give the uh, city manager's report now? Sure, I can do that. I add my thanks to the planning commission. They have to put up a Doug. <laughs> <laughs> we all have sacrifices yeah. to make. I appreciate you to making that. <laughs> um, so as uh, as this report goes, uh, I'll get make sure that this gets posted um, on the website probably by the end of the week. But um, this is, or as this is the lengthier version, but I will try to be brief. Um, as everyone has probably paid attention to um, COVID related news, um, we are as a state going back into a pause period. And so as an organization, we are uh, planning on what that will look like. And um, I think uh, at this point, there are a few questions still out there, but generally speaking, um, we're looking at this period from the 18th from Wednesday through December 2nd as possibly something that would get extended out, but also um, a period that uh, we'll probably view as, as similar to the early stages of COVID where we had some um, things closed um, 
you know, facilities closed and, and some services that were um, uh, more uh, distanced than uh, perhaps they normally are. Uh, one of the things we're likely to do, um, which I think has already been posted, is the library uh, will be closed to walk-in use. We'll have curbside available for the library services and um, some of our e uh, or electronic uh, book services are available as well. Um, you know, definitely is a hard thing to close the library, but um, given the need to, to protect folks' health and um, to try to, to flatten the curve, we're, we're doing the, what we can there. Um, you know, I think also um, the court, community court will be uh, paused for a few weeks. Um, we're looking to go back to um, you know, kind of an online-ish version. I think we're, we're looking to see whether we can do that and essentially um, have call-in court or some other uh, mechanism. But for now, I think we're likely to not have in-person court for a few weeks at least. Um, the City Hall Development Services area will be uh, open, although I think we're doing our best to limit the number of folks that come in as we have been already, but I uh, want to make sure that those services are continuing uh, because they're able to, to function out in the uh, fresh air and with physical distancing and all the other things. Um, so do what we can to, to balance um, that service being on, as it were, and, and available and protecting our staff and the public as well. Um, so the pause is, is upon us almost. And, uh, you know, I think hopefully we, we will not see a diminishment in services and service level. Um, we've had a lot of things, a lot of practice already in putting things online and um, augmenting our services. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue that. We are in the process of uh, finalizing some of our CARES Act funded projects. Uh, the um, Annex, the Archives Annex next door to City Hall is actually a functional uh, office space now. We had a few folks who are uh, physically distanced there in, in offices and it's allowed us to keep people on site and, and to work on some other work um, that they were not as quite as able to do when on offsite. So it's been helpful. Uh, we're in the process right now as well of overhauling our uh, emergency dispatch center. The uh, folks who do dispatch are probably about seven feet apart, but um, in a pretty enclosed environment. And we're trying to uh, provide them with a safer uh, COVID safe work and work space. So that is on order and hopefully will be received um, very shortly and, and installed. Um, I think beyond that, the other thing that's coming into force this week is the um, Oregon OSHA rules, uh, which uh, should also <laughs> require masks and distancing and all the other things. So. Uh, maybe all all coming together at the right time, but we shall see. So we are uh, ready for that, and hopefully businesses and, and folks in the community are ready as well. Other work, um, the mayor and I uh, had a meeting with the Visit McMinnville folks. Um, that was something that was hosted by Tace Newberg, and uh, it was a nice opportunity to hear about TLT and how McMinnville's used the program effectively and kind of the story there, a um, couple takeaways from my perspective, um, aside from good company. Uh, one, the, the stable table, which is essentially uh, a way for the various partners in the community to get together, have conversation, everybody kind of put down your agenda and talk about betterment of the community and do that on an ongoing basis. So everybody is communicating in the various uh, groups to, that are trying to better the economic development fortunes of, of town. Um, and then the other being um, every year they said that they put money aside for research and for um, kind of furthering the agenda and um, learning more about what what's going on in, in Minville and other areas that they can um, augment their um, their program to be more functional. And so I think that that uh, that kind of thing it seems like a, an interesting way for us to to continue to to build our and broaden our economic development um, assets in the community. The other uh, meeting related to economic development was the representatives from the commercial development company or CDC or otherwise known as the mill, the new mill owners uh, were in town last week and I uh, was able to meet with them as they're, uh, I think some of their folks are trying to actually see the mill for the first uh, time. Um, but I think a few of them just really trying to get the sense of the next steps for the project. They're in the process already of uh, phase one, which is to uh, inventory and sell the assets uh, that were on site, some of the tools and, and other equipment. 
And then uh, phase two will probably start sometime early next year, which is the uh, demolition of the existing buildings. And so it's exciting to, to see some progress uh, over at the mill site. Um, just real quickly, a few highlights from some of our departments. Um, just uh, we've tried to control the, the um, positions that we've added and or um, recruited for really just focusing on replacements. So uh, just wanted to highlight the fact that we have a couple of replacement positions available right now for recruitment in the police department, uh, looking for a lateral, looking for um, a, uh, a new officer. And so I've put those out, hoping that uh, we will get some really good candidates those mm -hmm. close December 2nd. Um, otherwise, uh, HR is busy with some policies related to COVID, uh, continuing to handle uh, some of that as uh, some of our staff, um, you know, as, as the COVID numbers increase, the likelihood of our staff uh, being contacted with, by COVID is increased. And so uh, we continue to kind of monitor that situation. Um, related to the communications and community engagement plan and program, um, that plan is coming to council on the 7th uh, for discussion. And I uh, look forward to hearing your comments on that. Uh, essentially, have the, the consultant has done um, internal and external survey, um, gathered some input from, from stakeholders. They've also um, created a, a report based on their own findings and, and review of our materials and, and presence online and, and some of those communication materials that we've put out in the public. And um, they will present those findings and hopefully that will be the next step to move forward on improving our communication internally and externally and, um, and helping to uh, think about audiences and, and tools and all kinds of other things there. Um, I think related, uh, let's see, for finance, um, transient lodging tax um, related to TLT conversation uh, that we had before. Um, in essence, the uh, first quarter came back as, as above zero, which is what we had predicted. The problem with our, our you know, the, that is good news. The problem, I think, comes later in the year when we thought we might be in a recovery mode and had budgeted accordingly to have some increase in the TLT. So I think when we have that January uh, touch on uh, the mid-year budget, we'll probably need to talk a little bit about that and maybe some adjustments that we'll want to make there. But for now, some good news in TLT. Um, related to public works, uh, they're also in the mode of, of refilling some positions. Um, you know, you're well aware Russ Thomas is the new director and so that creates a cascading effect of all kinds of other things along with a couple other individuals who've left us recently for other positions um, or retirement. And so uh, they're in the midst of sort of re refilling those chairs. Um, so there's been a fair amount of hiring activity there. Um, they're also, let's see, in engineering, working on um, the Memorial Park sidewalks. Hopefully you all have seen those. In the published report of this, I've got a couple of pictures that were provided for the sidewalk project, um, but definitely would encourage folks to check that out. Um, the sidewalk along the side and then the ADA ramps are installed and uh, should be ready for your, your walking use. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Another uh, downtown related project is that um, the Public Works folks had helped the downtown coalition with their recent um, power washing of uh, downtown streets, uh, providing some of the equipment I understand and, and uh, some support there. Um, C-Click Fix continues to be a tool that we're learning uh, and learning how to, to use well, I think. Um, we've had 32 of um, the the issues reported since launching in the late part of September, um, seeing numbers increase. Um, anecdotally, I've heard from a few staff members that, that seem to think that um, they're coming in, in batches as, as individuals uh, understand that there is the app and understand how to, to use it. You know, you kind of get a, a, a raft of, of issues presented. Um, the one problem with that we're discovering is that we're also getting a lot of anonymous issues and it makes it really challenging to follow up. And so if there are additional uh, points of information, sometimes a, a complaint might not get followed up on because there's not a, an individual assigned to it, um, a complainant. And so would encourage folks to, to put your name on it. We won't share it, but we, we do sometimes need to actually be able to follow up on those things. So um, to be effective as a tool, we've got to make sure we've got all that information. 
Um, Want to highlight something we've talked about a couple times now, the sidewalk program. Uh, there are $50,000 available in grant and loan programs uh, for residents. And now it's been expanded to small businesses for the loan program, at least. Um, so information about that's available on our website. And um, it is first come, first serve. So I encourage folks to check that out, get their uh, sidewalk projects started now in, that, in the queue. Um, I think we talked a little bit briefly uh, before about safe routes to school and um, that we're hearing, hopefully, cr fingers crossed, that we're on, on the funded list. So we should find out on that shortly, uh, the grant for Edwards Elementary. So uh, we're hopeful there that uh, we'll get some money. Um, let's see, related to um, facilities and, and the um, use of CARES Act fund. We've got uh, the Zoom room almost complete at the police department that will allow uh, online uh, testimony, online training, and, and a bunch of other things that should save some staff time and, and resources for us um, in the COVID environment. So that room is, is it sounds like almost ready to, to be used. Um, let's see what else. Um, there's highlights in here of all kinds of uh, nuts and bolts and, and details around public works, as there always are. Uh, one thing that I will share, I, I've gotten some feedback from uh, the communication ac uh, assessment, actually, of um, that folks don't always know how we do the work or what we do as far as some of the work. And, and so just a, a minor dive into some detail. Um, there's a picture in, in the report so to encourage maybe people to, to go check it out. But, uh, you know, if you didn't know, our water supply comes from wells and well field across uh, the river in Marion County. And so it, it comes across and, and the well water that we get uh, it contains iron, which is removed through the treatment process and it's captured in settling basins. And so around this time of year, uh, as we move into less uh, of an intense water use period, um, the staff is able to kind of clean those, those settling basins out. And so there's a photo of, of the, the uh, stuff sitting there and being hosed out uh, it's, it's a large uh, settling basin and just want to, you know, help to provide a little bit of a, literally a picture of what the work is that staff is doing. Um, it's kind of an interesting, I mean, literal side effect, I suppose, of where we get our water, how we process it, um, and just one element of what it takes to provide water to the community. Um, just uh, one or two last things. One, uh, compost sales uh, in October continue to be strong. Um, that's something that we had uh, given away earlier in the season. And apparently the amount of compost in October uh, was above our 10 year average. Uh, so one of those things where, uh, you know, I'm not sure what's going on there, but people are gardening and I'm guessing it has a little bit to, to do with COVID and some activities there, but um, we're seeing a lot of use of that, which is great. Um, and lastly, with the police department, I uh, just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, Chief Kosmicki had applied for a grant uh, for peer support team. And this is a team of folks who will be trained internally. And, and actually, the nice thing is with this grant, it connects to other uh, providers who use the same uh, platform. And so peer support being, um, you know, good, bad or ugly, it's a tough job to be a cop. And so sometimes having somebody you can have a conversation with, um, again, you know, whether you, you need it or not, um, somebody who you can have a conversation with is really a key element to retaining and, and to making sure we have really good police officers. And so getting this grant helps defray a good portion of the cost of this uh, implementation of the program, which is great. And getting the program online will be great for um, the mental health of our staff. And so just want to highlight that and, and uh, you know, appreciate that he was able to get, you know, prioritize getting the program online and then to get the funding to help defray the budget. It's great too. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, questions, folks? I'm eyeing raised hands. Uh, Bryce. Wonderful, uh, Dan. Thank you. A couple, few questions. One, you mentioned uh, thirty-one, I believe, or so folks that have used C -click Clicks outside of you know these meetings, and I imagine on our website and whatnot. What are the other ways in which we're getting the word out about C Click Fix? Um, I would have to check, to be honest. I mean, I think you named the ways that I, I would think we've typically done that, you know, mm -hmm. through the social media and, and website and other platforms we typically use. Um, but
but I think that that's been the prime primary way we've done it. Uh, I can definitely yeah. send an email with more information about how. Sure, no, that, that makes sense. And part of me wonders, you know, if that's part of why we aren't seeing as much as um, folks not really knowing about it, unless they're, you know, particularly involved in, in city council or, you know, enjoy clicking through our website to see our wonderful faces. Um, that, that might be <laughs> one thing. Uh, I had two other questions. One, so someone had asked me about um, where things were on uh, the, the previous approval of funds for a feasibility study for the daycare. Um, now, obviously, like, that process takes time. So my question isn't like, where is it at? What's happening? So, so much as, um, do you know what the timeline would be for some sort of update as to, like, the results of the study? Um, again, being new, is there a requirement that because of the dissemination of funds, like, there's, like, a report that lets us know how things are going or where things are at? Uh, you're talking about Project Oasis, right? Oasis, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't necessarily a condition of a report back. I think we can certainly make one happen. Um, and my understanding is that um, that uh, I don't think that the feasibility study has been completed yet. And so um, I think it would probably be in the beginning of next year, just based on the timing um, in terms of an update to the council. But um, I'm not sure... Um, that the funds have been spent yet. Uh, at least I'm fairly certain they have not. And so from that standpoint, you know, I think that they're in the process of, of doing some examination there. And I'm not sure if, if Doug or others have um, any more comment there because I know that they've gone through um, a pre-application meeting and some of those kinds of things for that site. Yeah, Dan, this is Doug. So I can say that, you know, they're working on that feasibility analysis um, and don't have a report back yet on that. So looking at their options. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, we're only really, what, like three or four weeks removed. So there's no expectation that a whole lot's done. I just wanted, I know there's a lot of excitement and energy around it. And so just to be able to give folks a response, say, hey, like, here's where you might expect to be able to see some things in the future. So that's, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, Councillor, so this is Doug again. We did hold a pre-application meeting with the consultant team uh, on, on that site and provided land use feedback of what would be required. So that's an indicator, you know, steps are being, are moving forward on doing an evaluation. Great, great, thank you. Councilor Crowfield, City Manager Weinheimer, if I could contribute as well. Sure. Thank you. Um, so just to support what Doug has shared, the feasibility study is moving forward. We are closely examining two properties within Newburgh City Limits. We believe as of this week, actually, we've wrapped up one of those pro properties as far as examining it for Project Oasis. I do know that we expect to have a full proposal on the results from the feasibility study in the early part of 2021 once the study on all properties being considered are complete. It will be a transparent study and open to questions. Nope. Big Channing. Just, uh, just for what it's worth, I, I met with... Uh... The two principals for Project Oasis on, on Friday toured, toured the one facility and got a bit of an update on the original site that they were looking at. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it's pretty exciting. All right. Anything else, Bryce? Nope. Anybody else? All right. I got two here, uh, Dan, and I don't necessarily need either answer at this moment, but, I, but just a couple things. Sorry. Okay, a couple of things to think about. Um, I'd like to know what, um, since we are looking to hire police officers, I'd like to know what we're doing in outreach in terms of DEI. Uh, I'd like to specifically know what, whatever, whoever is doing the recruitment for us, what they're doing. Uh, that's one. And I'd also like to know whether or not with this new round of closures for COVID, whether or not we've thought of any kind of business relief like we've done in the past. Um, you know, these restaurants and bars are gonna be closed here for a couple of weeks and they're gonna be pretty bad shape. Um, so those are two things that I'd, I'd like to hear about. Um, so that's. Okay. All right, um, anything else for Dan, folks? Anything else? All right, um, I think I've got 6.49 to take a break until our 
next session at seven o'clock. We will be back with the business uh, session of the evening and we will see you all then again. Planning commissioners, thanks again for being here. And uh, anytime, join us anytime, you're always welcome. Thank you, see y'all. Don't uh, just mute. All right, here we go, it's seven o'clock folks. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Newburgh City Council business session for November 16th, 2020. Uh, the meeting is called to order. A roll call, please, Sue. Councilor Cofield. Here. Councilor Yarnell Holloman. Uh, Councilor Martinez Plancarte. Present. Police is here. I couldn't get off mute. Okay. Um, Councilor Bacon. Here. Uh, Councilor Finley. Here. Thank you. All right, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty, thank you all. Um, presentations, let's go to 4A, that's the Tace Newberg quarterly report. Good evening, Leslie. Good evening. Wow, that was really fast. <laughs> That's hey. a big thing. Now I'm feeling pressure that I should go quickly now that you have bets on how soon you're going to be done. No, 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 no. Please take your time. Don't let us influence <laughs> you. Just that we're all watching the clock. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, take your time, please. Well, thank you, Mayor Rogers, Council, and staff. I'm Pleased to present Tace Newberg's uh, Fall 2020 Q1 quarterly report. Next slide, please. So for those new to hearing about Tace Newberg, I've included this page in the report, which recaps Tace Newberg's mission statement, purpose, and current board of directors and staff. Uh, we did have one board member change since the last quarterly report, and that is uh, with Shannon Buckmaster leaving the chamber. And um, we appointed Mark Boysen, who's the current Chehalem Valley Chamber board president, who will now serve in the ex officio capacity on behalf of the chamber. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned previously, our, our primary asset is our website. We've been busy updating the website regularly with fresh content, which includes adding new businesses, uh, listings and events. We are, up, we are able to upload our listings and events to uh, Travel Oregon's Otis system, which then populates to our site. And it also populates to Willamette Valley Visitors Association's website, which you can find at oregonwinecountry.org. We have a COVID and travel alerts resource page, which serves to provide visitor resources specific to traveler safety protocols, requirements and closures, as well as guidance on visiting restaurants and wineries and links to state and local resources. Um, we also employed that page for um, the Bald Peak Fire timeframe, just to give people some information about what was really happening um, in our area. So we also wrote and published blog stories about new business openings, events, and suggested travel itineraries. Uh, this quarter, July to September, included blogs about lavender farms, socially distant weekend getaway ideas, uh, the opening of CC Motor Coffee, and also the opening of Good Company Cheese Bar and Bistro. Um, total blog views were 36,000. And our goal generally at this time during COVID is to provide inspirational and safe travel ideas for Oregonians primarily, as well as to provide evergreen content that will index on Google to help improve our web page rankings. Next slide, please. So as far as our website analytics, uh, we launched the site in late March, as you might recall. And so we're now six months into existence, but for this, six months as of this, excuse me, this report. So we are in the building phase of gaining our website traffic as well as traction on social media. Our website users increased by 320% over last quarter. We had 3,608 sessions, 6,270 page views and an average of 1.6 minutes on site. 
um, our total website sessions had 221% growth over last quarter. Um, and Mayor Rogers, you had asked me on the last meeting too, how that compared to the chamber um, user sessions. And so I did pull those statistics and it shows that the chamber sessions during the same time last year had 798 sessions compared to our 3,608. Um, our social media results reflect growth as well, of 302% on Facebook and 185% on Instagram. Our Instagram has more followers than Facebook, but our engagement is much stronger on Facebook. So we believe that our audience will continue to grow steadily based on our post engagement strategy that we are currently employing. Next slide, please. So I've listed here some highlights of some of the social media mentions and shares that we um, posted throughout the quarter. Our social media focus has included inspiring stories and videos, day trip travel ideas, new business features and events, as well as safety protocols laced within those posts. We also shared Newberg tourism related stories that were featured on external media sites such as Coin TV and Forbes.com. We boost some of the Facebook posts based on strength of content and have been targeting specific demographics um, depending on the type of post. So we might only promote to in-state Oregon or in times where we felt we could, we would promote out to Seattle and Northern California as well. Next slide, please. So we also um, sent out stakeholder newsletters to our tourism industry business partners, including information about Travel Oregon small business webinars, uh, WABA's responsible reopening campaign, which I've touched on previously, uh, Newberg Wednesday, Wednesday Market, Shehalem Cultural Center events, new business openings events, and more. In September, we also did a specific e-blast to our lodging partners regarding the wildfire lodging assistance program through FEMA. And that's something that Travel Oregon is coordinating and we continue to report lodging availability for um, any evacuees that they are still finding shelter for. Next slide, please. So building our image library is a continual work in progress. This past quarter, we focused on capturing images of downtown cityscapes, diverse and or masked lifestyle shots, inspiring summer travel, lands, summer landscapes and outdoor recreation. We produced video for Newburgh Wednesday Market and shot numerous other short videos promoting outdoor beauty, the 99W drive-in, wineries with outdoor offerings and cycling. And there were over 800 8,400 video views on social channels. Next page, please. So during the quarter, I worked with our annual, with our public relations team on developing our annual plan and content calendar, designed an online media kit and created sample itineraries for the web page. We distributed a press release regarding Newberg's local lavender trail which had excellent media, media coverage on KGW, KPTV, and Forbes.com with over 29 million readership. We also distributed a press release regarding socially distant fall travel in Newburgh, which resulted in coverage on Thrill List. We had six media visits throughout the quarter with stories either published or in the queue for fall winter travel coverage. Some writers have postponed their visits due to COVID um, and we anticipate that publications will most likely change their storylines based on the recent two week freeze. So we're not sure what to expect. We were expecting a couple issues to come out in the next 30 days that who knows if, if our articles will get featured or not. We, we shall see. Next slide, please. So I've listed by month the media mentions that we have received for Newburgh area businesses. And so hopefully you will have a chance to read a few of the great articles that were published with mentions of Newburgh area. Um, of particular note is the amount of interest that we saw in the, the drive-in and outdoor activities. That was really the big push that we felt through July and August. Next slide, please. So road trips, outdoor dining, lavender farms and products were the primary focus of media coverage we earned in August. Next slide, please. And then our September media coverage um, 
shifted dramatically based on the Fall Peak fire. Um, so it was primarily fire and smoke related. We focused on Ruddock and Woods collaboration with World Central Kitchen and community volunteers to really to feed the first fire, the fires, first responders as well as evacuees, just to show you know resilience in the community and the things that, we're, that we do to support our bigger community. We also received coverage by Portland Monthly Magazine with mentions of wolves and people, and again the drive-in. Next slide, please. So this chart tracks the city of Newburgh receipts for lodging tax revenue per quarter. So July to September 2020 revenues year over year were down 55%. While visitor activity was fairly strong, the Allison is only renting 55% of their available rooms due to safety precautions and their average rates are down about 20%. So it definitely has an impact on, on that total transient lodging tax revenue number before COVID, they were representing about 70% of total TLT revenue in Newburgh, and they're down, I think, to about 56% right now. The good news is that actual quarterly revenue paid to Taste Newburgh was $45,000 compared to projected revenue of zero. So we were very happy to see that check. <laughs> So our business plan goal of growing leisure visitor volume and overnight stays continues to be hampered by COVID. Next slide, please. So one of our annual business plan goals is to nurture and support the community through tourism partnerships and collaboration. So through active engagement with our state, regional and county destination marketing organization teams, we are able to receive and deliver COVID specific training and education to our tourism industry business partners. We convened a fire communications action team to bridge time sensitive fire status and response information to media and our local business communities. We also participate in biweekly lodging availability um, spreadsheets to make sure that FEMA knows what our availability is in, in county. We continue to promote the Willamette Valley Responsible Reopening Program to convey what local businesses are doing to ensure safety protocols are in place for visitors to our area. And I also um, participate on the Race, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. We're currently participating in biweekly tourism specific educational sessions facilitated through an outside consultant, kind of just trying to wrap tourism around the DEI topic. Next slide, please. So we also meet regularly with the Willamette Valley Wineries Association to stay current with winery events, promotions, and marketing strategies. I volunteer on the Yamhill County Tourism Partnership Group. We recently concluded a countywide tourism photography grant program. We are also advocating for official tourism advisory committee status with Yamhill County and are making progress on that front. We are actually on a schedule for December work um, session, which we hope will be the final step towards becoming that official advisory body to the county commissioners, tourism related. Um, and we also supported the city of Newburgh's Mask Up Newburgh program, as well as continue to participate on the Newburgh Economic Development Strategy Group meeting. Meetings, I should say. Next slide, please. So this takes us to our budget recap and if you take a look at the July to September column that's what we're reporting on this time. So Taste Newberg's share of TLT revenue funds received in the first fiscal quarter was $3,500. So this amount reflects what was paid for April to June quarter as we don't receive our payment until after the quarter ends. So what posts into our books is $3,500 which really actually represents what happened from the April to June time frame. So we continue to control expenses as much as we possibly can. Our biggest expense line items were for payroll, public relations, and the annual audit fee. Marketing campaign expenses are on hold for the most part while we wait for COVID conditions to improve. Our fiscal year TLT revenue is projected to increase by subsequent quarters. So it, it, you know, based on when we, we were all working on budgets and, and when everything got finalized, I think in May, um, we thought we'd be coming out of this a little bit sooner than, than what's actually occurring. So 
we may be looking at revenue shortfalls that would cause us to dip into our reserve fund as well as into our carryover funds. And so that's kind of what we're looking at from a, from a 12 month perspective of, of budget versus actual revenues. And so that's pretty much my presentation for today. And I would love to be able to answer any questions you might have. Okay then folks, uh, that's your cue. Questions? Got the hand raise function waiting for you to raise the blue hands on this screen. All right. Well, all right. Oh, I got one. Bryce, there we go. Leslie, good to see you again. Um, uh, it was good to meet with you earlier. And you answered a lot of my questions then. A couple of things that popped up since then. One, um, I'm glad, you know, obviously hear from Dan earlier that the, the TLT uh, wasn't zero as anticipated. So that's great. Um, but like you'd mentioned, it'll be interesting to see as, um, as COVID continues to persist longer than we'd hope, how, uh, how that ends up affecting things moving forward. So in looking at your current budget, um, how are you all anticipating making up for what might be a longer COVID period that's affecting TLT than you would have previously anticipated or budgeted for? Good question. Um, you know, right now we, you know, we're very fortunate to have the carryover funds from um, this past fiscal year. And so I've been really hanging on tightly to those funds, anticipating that we would spend them we had already planned to spread that money out over a three-year time frame. And so when we su submitted the numbers for the budget cycle this year, we knew that we would have carryover for next year. Um, the concerning part is if those revenues don't come in as anticipated for the balance of this fiscal, then we'll probably be forced to spend, to allocate those carryover funds. And then we would have to look at different revenue funding mechanisms for 2021 20 yeah. That makes sense. Um, along the, those same lines, so a, two questions. One mm -hmm. is based off of, um, again, you can't really predict anything, right? It's a chaos right now. Um, but assuming what we've seen recently, again, continues to recur, do you have a rough idea? I think you said you anticipated approximately three years for the care of our funds to, to help sustain you. Um, my guess is that timeline has has kind of been shot at this point do you have an idea of based off of the previous quarters um how much time effectively you would have left if things perform at roughly the same rate mm -hmm. you know off the top of my head i don't but i would say that from memory if memory serves me correctly i think that i had a ninety six thousand dollar carry over to the following year so I don't know, probably yeah. the end of this fiscal. Okay, that's, that's that's good to know. And part of why I ask, and this is for the, you know, the council and the folks listening, is it, I mean, it, it seems like from what I've understood in our conversations, there's um, there's reason to believe in looking at our sister, you know, city of McMinnville, but I don't know if they're technically our sister city, next door neighbor, that there's good reason to believe that this can be successful. But uh, my concern would be that if COVID continues to go, this will sink before it actually has a chance to fly. And so, you know, I'd be curious as, as to, um, you know, here, you, you mentioned other funding streams that you might have to explore. Can you give us an idea of what those might be? Well, you know, there's, we've been having conversations with the chamber about the visitor center and the funding that they receive for the visitor center. Um, I participated in a, a statewide conversation between uh, most of the DMOs this last week about what are they doing with their visitor centers? A lot of the a lot of visitor centers are being closed as far as the physical locations, and they're migrating to either a mobile visitor center or just going online with a chat bot on their their web page, their websites. And so, you know, we might, you know, really have to take a look at that, have a conversation about that money that's been previously allocated to chamber visitor center operations, and whether it makes more sense to reallocated to to our side of the equation where we can you know activate more visitor marketing and promotion when we're poised and ready to really kick that off full steam 
Thank you. you know, one thing I'd like to mention here, if I could, um, and this, this came out with the discussion that we had with the good folks from McMinnville, which first off was very kind of them to do, if any of them are listening, Mayor Hill, et cetera. Um, but if you all recall, the city of Newburgh with the TLT money divides it 65% to the general fund and 35% to tourism activities, all right? Of which a portion, as, as Leslie mentioned, the first largest portion goes to the visitor center and essentially what's left, as I understand it, goes to Taste Newburgh. So McMinnville, by contrast, their TLT money is split 70, 30, 70% going to their tourism promotion organization. So it's exactly flipped. So just keep that in your hat. And I know Matt's probably cringing at the moment that I mentioned this. But anyway, just, just keep, that, keep that in mind. So there it is. Any other questions for Leslie, folks? Jules. I don't have a question so much, Leslie, but I just want to know that I really appreciate the visuals. I think last time that you were here with us, we gave you some input and I really see, you know, a lot of you and other folks within the city um, really taking some steps. I know that for some of some folks, it may seem very minimal, but I think just being able to see more of that like representation out there is really important. So especially in systems that, you know, uh, folks haven't been allowed in the past, but just doing those things is really appreciated. Thank you. Friend speaks my mind. Other comments or questions for Leslie? All right, I do not see any at the moment. Leslie, thank you, right? Thank you for all your, your great work. And um, we're gonna have, people are coming back. They're coming back to Newburgh, don't you worry. This COVID thing, it's almost over, almost done. Take, get, you heard it here first, it's almost done. And then we'll have people flocking to us, so. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and have a nice evening, Leslie. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, uh, we, we had the city manager's report for those who were not listening to the work session. Uh, now on to, oh, I've got a proclamation first. Sorry. My apologies. Sorry. I know Sue was about ready to get me. All right. A proclamation. This is a proclamation recognizing small businesses in Newburgh. And I won't go through it all, but I'll give you at least the highlights. Whereas the city of Newburgh celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community, according to the United States Small Business Administration, there are currently 30.2 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all businesses with employees in the United States, are responsible for 65.9% of net new jobs created from 2000 to 2017. And so, Small business employ 47.5%. You can read the extent of the proclamation for small businesses online, but I will say now therefore it is proclaimed by the mayor and city council and on behalf of the citizens of the city of Newburgh, Oregon, that we proclaim November 28, 2020 as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of Newburgh and communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. So there it is. If you are shopping for Christmas time, shop local, right? We've got a lot of nice little stores downtown that need to see you. Wear a mask, shop local. All right, all right, um, next, uh, council appointments. All right, I would like to Rick. appoint yeah, people, uh, a number of volunteers for the appointment to ad hoc stormwater, wastewater, and water citizens advisory committee for a term of November 20 to March 2021. And those folks are, and we should always recognize those who want to step up and volunteer, uh, civil engineer Leonard Rydell, Fox staff member Jeremiah Horton, CPRD staff member Casey Creighton, Newburgh High School teacher and CPRD board member Pete Sidirius, local developer Mike Googler, and from Sustainable Newburgh, Merrill Kunkel, uh, CRRC Representative Bill Rourke, local developer Mackenzie Davis, uh, local resident Connie Woodbury. Um, I am an ex officio member and Brett Music is a staff liaison. And to that list, which it did not appear in your packet, I would like to add the esteemed Denise Bacon, Councillor Bacon to this, to this list. So if you will indulge me folks, I'd love a motion to that effect. <clears throat> 
Mr. Mayor, Nothing. so moved. All right, and a second. A second. All right, Bryce with a second. All right, any further discussion? All in favor, signify by raising your left hand. And that looks to be unanimous. All righty, thank you all. And thank you to those who have uh, gratefully given up their time. So thank you, thank you so much, folks. All Rick, right. Uh, Rick, Rick. Yes. Yeah. So Josh Duder is on the call from hey, the chamber to formally yeah. kind of accept the proclamation. Oh, Josh. Red. Yeah. yeah. Greetings. We spoke early Wave, this Josh. morning. Good evening, Josh. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I, I was uh, listening for the during the first presentation period, but I wasn't uh, my camera and my mic wasn't on. So uh, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and in coordination with the Downtown Coalition, um, I officially appreciate and accept the proclamation. Is that the is that the way I should do it? That sounds great. If that works me, for everybody Bob. else. I'm happy to say it. <laughs> that sounds perfect. That's great. And uh, again, we'll do all we can to get people to shop local, and that's uh, that makes makes a big difference. So so thank you, and, and Josh, thank you for all you're doing. I said this to you earlier today, but you picked a heck of a time to. Uh, pick up the job that you did this COVID thing makes it makes it hard to uh to do what you're doing so thank you for thank you sir for that. thank you all right uh let's see uh public comments as i heard this afternoon we do not have any general public comments and none have come in since by the way for anyone out there listening the deadline for public comments is 12 o'clock on monday the day of the city council meeting uh, part of that has to do with the fact that we are doing these um, electronically. And so we have to make sure that uh, our city uh, recorder can do all her multiple tasks while these meetings are occurring. So, so thank you. All right, moving on, item 8A, the resolution, this is a consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move to adopt the consent calendar. Right. Second. And a second from Elise. Any, well, any further discussion on the consent calendar? Hearing none, raise your left hands if you are in favor of the motion. And we've got a unanimous. All right, thank you, folks. All right, as I said, we were going to move item number 9A um, to after the items in continued business. So let's move to ordinance 2020-2868, an ordinance amending the Newburgh Comprehensive Plan and Map and Newburgh Municipal Code. And I will leave that at that point, but a couple of reminders, I believe these are continuations on these. Um, so keep that in mind and we will attempt to read by title only this evening. Um, so there we are. And with that, I will pass it over to Mr. Rux. Thank you, Mayor. Doug Rux, Community Development Director. Um, so at your November 2nd meeting, you opened the public hearing, took testimony, uh, did deliberations, in regards to the Riverfront Master Plan amendments. And it was requested that the second reading be held over until November 16th. We have since done that. Uh, the party that requested the holdover to November 16th was uh, CDC, uh, owners of the new mill site. And so as Dan mentioned in the city manager report, we had the opportunity to talk with them about the Riverfront Master Plan. And we received no additional comments uh, prior to this meeting this evening. And so at this point in time, we would be back to the mayor in the council for a motion. And then Sue Ryan would be in position to read by title only for the council. Thank you. One thing I, I should, and I, my, I neglected to say, we should though, again, conflict of interest or abstentions. Uh, let's ring in on those, anyone? Again, Riverfront Master Plan. So Denise. Yes, um, I live in the riverfront master plan area okay and i live between the two legs of the riverfront master plan area so um, there is a declarations anyone else okay um, any further discussion on this one folks all right um, a, a motion would be great um, again include by title only mr mayor definitely I would like to move that we adopt ordinance number 2020-2868, read by title only. Thank you. Second? Second. 
Okay, Bryce with a second. All right. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, let's read by title only, please. Um, ordinance 2020-2868, an ordinance amending the Newburgh Comprehensive Plan and Map and Newburgh Municipal Code, Title 15 Development Code 15.05.110, adoption of zoning map 15.300 to 15.500 for regulations related to the Riverfront Master Plan Appendix A and Appendix B. Any further discussion, folks? All right, hearing none, um, we need a voice vote on this one, please. Councillor Cofield? Uh, yes. Councillor Yarnell Holloman? Yes. Councillor Martinez Plancarte? Yes. Mayor Rogers? Yes. Councillor Bacon? Yes. Councillor Findlay? Yes. Mayor uh, passes 6 0. Okay, thank you very much. All right, moving on to item 10B, a Newburgh Action Plan Annual Report. Um, and again, let's start with, we're calling this again to order. Um, is this a continuation, Doug? Remind me. This is an this had, item. This is an information item. It was on your calendar for, no, okay. for November 2nd. There is no action for you to take tonight in okay. regards to this proposal, but this is to give you the first annual update on the community visioning program known as A Newberg. Um, so you've all had a chance to read through the material. I'm just gonna hit some highlights. Um, remember, as shown in the graphic here, we have community engagement, community leadership, cultural assets, economic development, livability and development. So the visioning program was adopted by council on August 19th, 2019. So we've gone through that first full year. Uh, I should give praise where it needs to. Lacey Digraph put together this graphic for us. So you have the written word version, um, but Lacey and I worked together and she did 99% of the work. I provided the words and she put together this graphic. And so this is what we would use uh, to put up on our website and to promote out to the public. I think what's really important, I've had a number of questions that have come up over the course of the last year of what are we doing with A Newberg? Uh, there's no committee that's meeting. Are there any activities that are moving forward? And as you can see that there actually are quite a few things that have happened over the course of the last year. Sue, you wanna scroll down a little bit, please? And so under community engagement, um, it's really the Community Wellness Collective is the one that has been really active uh, under this particular category and working uh, diligently and very hard in the community to assist the community overall. Sue, scroll down, please. Under community leadership, um, the ones that have occurred over the year are really uh, related to getting the word out to the public. And so with the pandemic, we've gone virtual. So all of this information is out there. It's up on YouTube. Uh, all the audios available for the public to be able to see for those who are not able to access the, access the meetings on any given night. And then of course, we are continuing to update our city websites um, by various departments for activities. So scroll down, go to cultural assets. And under this category, um, it was talking about, you know, we have been designated as the Camellia City. And so there have been conversations with the uh, Taste Newberg about marketing that. And so you saw presentation tonight and we will continue to talk with uh, Taste Newberg about uh, noting that Newberg is the Camellia City. The next one, Sue, scroll down please, uh, is public art. And so you may remember is that a coalition came together in front of the city council. We did a work session followed up by a resolution and the council has endorsed the public art program. And so as noted on your slide, the uh, downtown coalition, the cultural center, historical society and the university are all involved in that. The other one was dealing with public art and urban renewal. And so I mentioned earlier in some of the presentations that we are uh, Items for art have been included in the list for the Urban Renewal Committee to uh, take a look at. 
Uh, there are some limitations on art in uh, Oregon Revised Statute now, but there's things that can be done about art pedestals and so forth that could be able to support art in public sidewalks. Sue, scroll down, please. So economic development is the one that has had the most activity. And I really don't want to go through all of them, but what we can continue to do is we're coordinating with all of our partners in this pandemic. We have to. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis every Friday and do a virtual call. Uh, Sue down. We've continued to coordinate with the accelerator and starting new businesses. Uh, down a little more, please. The brokerage community, we, we're meeting with them. Uh, Enterprise Zone, we continue to promote that activity. Sue, down a little more, please. Uh, always talking with developers about development. Uh, entrepreneurs, and so the next piece. Uh, the city is part of a coalition uh, for Launch Mid Valley. And so that's working with cities within the Mid Valley area. Uh, there is a staff member that is working. He's talking with entrepreneurs. They've had a pitch fest. They've awarded two companies some money. Unfortunately, those were not from Newberg in the first round. Uh, but this is continuing again to, to vet, and there's coordinations between Launch Mid Valley and the uh, Shehalem Valley Innovation Accelerator. The next uh, two or three, two, get to the accelerator specifically. Uh, space is full in there. Uh, we are continuing to meet on a monthly basis as a board of advisors for that and helping businesses. So a lot of this goes back to uh, addressing the pandemic issues. Sue, down a little bit more. Uh, the next three, we're addressing urban renewal. And so just a reminder, you accepted a feasibility study, you created an agency, and we're now working on the plan on the report. Sue, down a little more. The next couple are dealing with downtown activities. Activities. So the vertical housing development zone continues. Uh, construction excise tax will be on your agenda later this evening and the West End uh, Mill District. And then uh, with the pandemic, uh, of course, parking has diminished in the downtown area. And um, we had a parking study evaluation plan for this fiscal year. We'll have to determine if we're going to advance forward with that. Um, visitor Center. Um, functions. And so those have continued on uh, being operated by the Chamber of Commerce. And then Leslie just provided some information about uh, Taste Newberg and where they're at. So we're uh, continuing those coordination efforts. Uh, and they're also working with our major businesses and employers. And so I don't need to get in more on that because Leslie just gave you one. I know there's been a lot of conversations about a hotel in Newberg. I can candidly say when the pandemic started, uh, all conversations on hotels have stopped. Uh, hopefully as we proceed forward, um, that will change. Under livability and development, Sue, now a little bit more. Um, it was talked about earlier by the city manager about sidewalks. And so we're always looking at ADA improvements. And so Memorial Park is an example of something to increase that accessibility. Uh, so that kind of covers the first two. The next one down a little bit, Sue, is transit. So we adopted transit plan update, and that's now in our code. Uh, engineering has been working on safe routes to schools, and this is for the Edwards Elementary. So Brett Music has been working on that diligently. Housing affordability. Um, we talk about housing. You had your recent presentation on work programs, but prior to that, um, a lot of different activities and we did get grant money and so we'll be looking at cottage clusters as well as other middle housing over the course of the next um, seven months to a year and a half as we move forward. Do down a little more please. And then uh, under the downtown improvement plan, I've touched on this a little bit, but it's the craft industrial in the West End Mill District. Uh, we're moving that forward continuing the discussions on the Butler property. And I talked about the hotels a little bit earlier, down a little bit more, Sue. Um, urban growth boundary. So we did a lot last year, um, working on the economic opportunities analysis, the housing needs analysis, the public semi-public land analysis. More of that information will be coming back to you in early 2021. Then 
we are continuing to always coordinate with our utility companies on infrastructure that's necessary. You had a presentation this evening on the TSP update and where we're at in that process. And then last but not least, was we always participate with the Parkway Committee in trying to seek that additional funding for phase two of the bypass. So there's actually has been quite a bit that has occurred over the course of the last year. Uh, we need to do a better job of getting this information out. We will, like I mentioned earlier, we'll get it up on our webpage and I'll have Lacey do some posting out on social media uh, so the public can see that we are actually, we listen to them and we are doing things to implement a new bird. Thank you. Awesome, Doug, thank you. Um, any questions or comments for Doug? Not seeing any. Well, uh, sorry, Bryce. Go ahead. Yeah, you what that real quick, Doug. Again, always as always, great, great work. Um, one thought I had around communication in terms of getting it out. Do we have a booth or anything at the Wednesday night market when those are held? We did uh, coordinate a booth with. Um, uh, we actually were working with the sustainability uh, group, the the community sustainability group, on a booth um, more to towards the middle and end uh, on of the market, but we likely would use that again. It was a good okay. avenue for us. Yeah, no, that's a, a great idea. And I think even to highlight outside of what we're doing around sustainability, some of these other, again, really good things that are occurring, I think, especially given the amount of time that uh, went into the community speaking into the vision, being able to use something like a booth to, to communicate that could be another way um, outside of, you know, just website or something like that. The other thing we Great did, work. Counselor, was uh, we did spend four weeks at the farmer's market, the Wednesday market, uh, getting feedback from the community on the urban renewal program. Good work. All right, any, anything else? All right, Doug, thank you. Thank you so much for the update. Let's move on to item 10C on your program. This is ordinance 2020-2860, an ordinance establishing a construction excise tax. All right, uh, this, we, again, this is a continuation. This is a second reading, uh, but I would like to start with declarations of conflict of interest or abstentions. Anyone? All right, seeing none. Um, I, I do, sorry, again, go ahead, Bryce. Uh, before I, I work at George Fox, um, not directly involved in a lot of like capital projects or whatnot, but as an employee, there would be, you know, somewhat of a, I guess, a trickle down effect. Thank you. And uh, as I've, I've noted before, my, my day job, I'm the executive director of the Habitat for Humanity affiliate here in Newburgh. And we are a volunteer driven self help home ownership program that serves low to very low income residents. So consequently, I could have a potential conflict of interest for any money coming through construction ex tax. All right, that having been said. Um, all right, and again, we have closed public testimony for this, but Doug, if you could give us an update and a staff report, that would be great. Thank you, Mayor. Doug Rocks, Community Development Director. So from your meeting on November 2nd, um, you held the first reading, took your public testimony, uh, you deliberated, you provided some feedback to staff. Uh, we've incorporated that into the final version that's in your packet tonight. And there's actually the last attachment is the track changes that shows uh, those modifications from that particular discussion. Uh, to briefly step, uh, kind of summarize those, uh, one was looking at a sunset provision. And so there is a sunset provision now in the proposed ordinance. And that would be at year five, uh, doing a review and coming back and holding a public hearing in year six. Um, and we would have to develop metrics and so forth to measure the progress, success, and so forth of that program. There were some uh, additional comments that came in that are, uh, went out as a supplemental to your packet. One of the items I noted from the meeting in November was this issue about making installment payments. And we've included in the packet, we got a legal opinion uh, that we cannot do installment of payments. So that provision was taken out. Uh, of the final ordinance. And so the, at the time of issuance of building permit, the construction excise tax would have to be paid. The other piece of that, it, that means that we have been working on something you're gonna have an ordinance on uh, review later is collection and payment of the school district construction excise tax has to occur at the issuance of building permit as well. 
Um, and then the, the last piece of that was the construction excise tax not being paid for affordable housing projects. And so I noted that in the body of the ordinance that would, came to you in October and November, that language was already in place. The question usually comes up, well, how does that work? Will there be a contractual arrangement? So if a developer wanted to provide some affordable housing units, uh, they could make an application to the city. Then there would be a contract. There would be a recorded deed, a restriction on that deed for that affordability for 60 years. So that's for 80% or less of the median family income. So those are the changes uh, that were done to the ordinance since November. So Mayor, I will pass it back to you. Great, thank you. And normally again, at this time, we would go into public testimony, but that has been closed. Um, all right, questions uh, for Doug, anyone? Okay. All right, well, Doug, we will, we will take your recommendation then. Um, staff's recommendation is to adopt ordinance number 2020-2860. Doug, just one question. When when will it be implemented under this? No sooner than January 1st. Um, so our next step, if the ordinance passes, we will have to go in and work with our vendor on our permit system, uh, get the appropriate modifications done. Uh, but the soonest it would occur would be January 2nd, because January 1st is a holiday. Uh, could be slightly after that. It depends on timing of getting all the permit system modifications made. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions for Doug, folks? All right. Um, we will, um, all right, I'm just, one comment on this one. Um, seeking additional revenue during the times of a pandemic is challenging, right? This is a challenging thing. Um, but we've put this, I mean, we've, this has been in the hopper for quite a number of years, ever since you know, the original SB 1533 came through. Um, in the past, I voted, as you know, against items that impacted revenue, but I will vote for this, particularly because I think this benefits some of the people that are at most risk right now in our community. So there you go. Um, all right, any other comments, folks? All right. Um, so if we could have a motion and remember, read by title only. Mr. Mayor. Stephanie. I would like uh, to move that we adopt ordinance number 2020-2860, read by title only. Second. And at least with a second. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, if we could read by title only, please, Sue. Ordinance number 2020-2860, an ordinance establishing a construction excise tax and creating chapter 3.60 in the Newburgh Municipal Code. All right, all in favor, uh, this will be a voice vote. Yes, this will be a voice vote. So Sue will uh, follow with that. Here we go. Uh, Councilor Cofield. Yes. Councillor Yarnell Holloman. Yes. Councillor Martinez Plancarte. Yes. Mayor Rogers. Yes. Councillor Bacon. Yes. Councillor Finley. Yes. Mr. Mayor, six zero. Thank you. One other comment on this, and I, I really, I gotta give credit. I think it's probably Ezra Hammer, and I know Denise mentioned this as well. The idea of having a sunset clause and these kinds of things, I think is fantastic because we really don't know what it's going to do. We can, we can hope for the best, but we're not gonna know until we know. So there you are. All right, let's now, we're moving, we're moving back now to item nine. This is a public hearing on ordinance 2020-2869, an ordinance amending chapter 13 of the Newburgh Municipal Code to modify system development charge regulations. And I believe, uh, so this hearing is now called to order. Declaration of conflict of interest or abstentions, folks. All right, again, uh, I mentioned earlier, I work with Habitat for Humanity in town, so we occasionally pay systems development charges. Although I must say, 
the city does have a provision to waive them a couple per year for affordable housing for anyone developing affordable housing. So there you go. All right, and I think next, this is a, a staff report from Karn, I believe. Good evening, Karn. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, so th this is a um, companion piece to the CET tax that you've been working with Doug on. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, staff began discussions on the construction excise tax with the Affordable Housing Commission in January of 2019. As a part of that, one of the um, feedback that came out of that proposal was for the consideration of timing of when you have to pay the SDC. Right now, SDCs are required at the time of connection and or um, when building permits are issued. And they requested um, to defer the SDC payment until a final inspection or certificate of occupancy is ready. Um, we had a discussion with uh, Mr. Hammer of the Home Builders Association and we're concerned about leaving it that late in the game because what we didn't want to do was have um, people ready to move in and but yet we're still trying to get payments in. So um, our proposal was to um, put off the collection of SDCs until such time as a um, installation inspection is is requested. That's about 75% into the building permit uh, phase, which um, allows for delaying of that collection and um, gives them a little bit more time before they have to make those payments. So the, the ordinance tonight would allow for that payment of the system development charge for single family residents and duplexes only to be deferred until, until the construction is approximately 75% complete. And then it also sets the payment amount at the time of payment versus the time of application. These changes will help decrease the cost of the home builder and will work in conjunction with, with the CET that you, the council adopted. And uh, that is the staff report that I have at this point. Okay, thank you, Karn. Uh, normally this would be the time for public testimony. We did not receive any. I know Ezra, I'm sorry, you're on the line. Uh, I would normally take the, the testimony, but earlier today I had to say no to someone else who missed our deadline, so, so my apologies. Um, and the deadline again for anyone listening in is 12 noon on the day of the council meeting. So yeah, contact Sue Ryan if you would like to give public testimony either on a particular item on the agenda or general comments. So, all righty. Um, all right, so with that, the best public testimony is now closed. All right, and Karn, the recommendation from staff, please. Mayor, council, our recommendation from staff is for council to adopt ordinance number 2020-2869. Yep, thank you. Any, any questions for Karn, folks? Okay. All right. Not seeing any. How's about a, uh, how's about a motion? You, you haven't waived you haven't waived the second reading on this one. Yeah, that's the first one. Yeah, okay. so let's see if we'd like to start with a waiver first. Denise. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we waive the second reading. Okay. Second. Yeah, uh, uh, Jules with a second. All right, any further discussion? Okay, in this case, all in favor signify by raising your left hand. Okay, that passes unanimously, Sue. All right, so we have waived the second reading. Um, and now let's move into the uh, motion for the ordinance itself. Come on. All right, I'll motion to adopt ordinance number 2020-2869. And, and do we have to waive the second reading on this one too? You just waived the second reading. I just, we just, you want to read it by title only. No, that's what I meant. Or I could read the whole thing. No, don't read the whole thing. Okay. And I read that by title right. only. Thank you. Yes. Move to adopt ordinance 2020 2869, read by title only. Nice. All right. Mayor, I'll second that. Thank Den you, Denise. All right. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, we'll have a voice vote. Okay. Here's first, I have to play attorney. Okay. Um, ordinance number 2020-2869, an ordinance amending chapter 13 of the Newburgh Municipal Code 
to modify system development charge regulations. Now I'll call for the vote. Um, and I promised Bryce I would reverse the order. Uh, Councillor Finley. Yes. Councillor Bacon. Yes. Mayor Rogers. Yes. Councillor Martinez Plancarte. Yes. Councillor Yarnell Holloman. Yes. And Councillor Cofield, you were last this time. Yes, and I appreciate you, Sue. You're welcome. All uh, right. Mayor Thank Six you, Zero. Folks. Um, I think if I'm following correctly, we're now on to item 11A. This is new business, the Newburg Economic Development Strategy, COVID-19 priorities, and I think it's Doug and Shannon. I had them much earlier in the program tonight. Now we're on correctly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so back in November of 2018, we updated the Newburg Economic Development Strategy, the acronym NEDS. Uh, to incorporate all the changes from the community feedback from a new Berg. Uh, as we move forward in the next year, of course, the pandemic hit. And so we started back in late May talking about the group pivoting and what we should be focusing on. Uh, of course, the document has a lot of elements to it. It's got the industrial sector, commercial sector. Um, it's got... Um, business and workforce development, it's got downtown Newburgh, and then it's got tourism and hospitality. And there's a lot of actions and activities that are in there. So in the full document, there are 28 strategies and 120 actions. So as we went through the discussions over the summer, <clears throat> while everyone was working uh, with businesses addressing the issue of COVID-19, uh, we came to some agreement of what we should focus on. So with this one, you're not asked to make any decisions. We're just giving you information update about where we're at with the NEDS document. Um, so it's always good as a reminder of who's involved with this NEDS document. And so that is SEDCOR, Downtown Coalition, uh, Visit Newburgh, Chamber, uh, Pacific Crest Realty, Newburgh Public Schools, and of course the city. And so through those conversations and what's in your packet is a list of things that we've identified that we would focus on as we're going through this pandemic. So that addresses 19 strategies and 41 actions. Uh, disproportionately, uh, the focus is on the element of business development and workforce development. So that's directly working with our businesses. Uh, that is then followed by activities in the industrial sector and the commercial sector. Again, it's, a lot of it is focused on working with our local companies. Um, next is the downtown. And of course that relates back to the downtown coalition and working with our businesses. And finally is uh, four items or four actions that are addressed in our tourism and hospitality section. Uh, in the document you have in your packet this evening, we specifically identified which is a COVID-19 priority. Uh, the group who meets on a monthly basis will continue, as I've said before, to focus on all of that. Um, there will be an annual report that will be coming on the NEDS document and that will be coming to you in January. I should share that we've asked all of our partners to take it to their respective boards. And so the accelerator has shared it with their board of advisors. I uh, did a presentation to the chamber, uh, did a presentation to Taste Newberg. Uh, Molly was covering the downtown coalition and we shared the information uh, with the school district and we'll let them put that on their particular agenda to provide an update. So we have touched all the bases with all of our partners so that everybody knows what it is that this group is working on. Shannon, have anything else you might want to add? I'll just add that it was um, actually really great to see all of our community partners come together to agree upon and prioritize what we saw as our community's best response to not only COVID-19 as a pandemic, but also the emotional, or the emotional, that was a slip, economic recovery process that our community is facing as we move forward. We did focus uh, both on the short term immediate needs of our community, but also long-term solutions so that we become less re reactionary and more visionary in our long-term planning. It's always important to note for the council members is even though we prioritize some things is that opportunities do arise. That does not mean we forget about the rest of the document. Uh, we're still tracking along. 
we have a very long tracking sheet that we prepare every month. And so uh, though we have these, these focus areas, we are still watching all the elements and all the actions that are necessary in the strategy overall. Thank you. All right, questions, folks, or comments? Okay. Uh, yep. I do have a comment. I just want to say for this, I think uh, it really is important that we visionary in these kinds of reactionary, and I appreciate being updated on this and knowing that how hard everyone at the city is working on making sure that we're taking care of our community during these times. So um, I'm really appreciative. All right, anyone else? All right, um, so I, I got a comment or two anyway. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I, I understand the, the methodology of going from 120 action items to 41 that might be COVID related. Um, so the, the first question is, um, you folks, you folks highlighted DEI and, um, and urban renewal as goals in the council. I'm curious first why you didn't include customer service because businesses would certainly seem to me to be our customers. And then secondly, I wonder if you could point out which of these were particularly DEI sensitive, which of these actions of the 41 and you don't have to do it now, but it's just something to think of in the, in the future. The other thing I mentioned during the work session and that I, I hope we will consider is whether or not there are resources immediately available to assist the businesses as they may need. Um, I, think, I think we've got captive audience in the Chamber of Commerce and in the Downtown Coalition to find out exactly what the businesses need right now um, and whether or not we revisit, because in this I don't see anything where we're revisiting um, utility rebates like we did before, uh, the notion of shopping local and there being some kind of a refund for that or any other money that might be directed to our businesses as they're struggling. Um, the other thing is I, I really, you know, I keep seeing businesses that are going out of business um, and I would like to uh, probably make sure that we are tracking that if we are not already. Um, as I say, between Midget mm -hmm. Motors, Laser Quick, Heritage mm -hmm. Bank, et cetera, um, I, I think we need to, to make sure that we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, but the question in, the, in all of this is, are we looking at anything right now to help the businesses, particularly bars, restaurants, and lodging establishments for the next couple of weeks when they're going to be closed uh, to traffic? City manager and I have not had that conversation. But we will. <laughs> I hope that we yep. might. Um, I think that there's hopefully there might be some kind of resources out there. Um, and I, I think um, that, like I said, our member organizations are probably poised to know or they could probably find, find out pretty quickly anecdotally what would be of assistance at this point. Well, I know, Mayor, uh, based on a conversation we had on Friday, it looks like Business Oregon is coming out with around five. Um, for funding assistance. Uh, Willamette uh, Workforce Partnership currently has a program uh, that's open to the Mid Valley and it's been shared with businesses, with our different organizations to push that at businesses. So there's already some programs that are currently in place, but specifically to your question about have we talked about local dollars as we did in the first round, um, city manager and I and finance director would have to have a conversation on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that'd be great. I mean, even if, even if it's something that, that has to do with uh, municipal services bill, et cetera, uh, whatever it may be. And, and again, I think we could easily reach out if we wanted some ideas of how we might be able to do that, that would benefit the community. All right. Any other questions or comments, folks? All right. Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update. Um, and let's see, I think we are now on to item 12, uh, council business and uh, Councillor Bacon, I think this may be your cue for SDC fees. I, um, I've been approached by a few uh, businesses and hearing rumors all over um, 
that the transportation SDCs that you, we talked about a little bit earlier, for businesses that are moving, there's been a couple instances where those numbers have come in extremely high. Um, I'm talking like $200,000 to move your business from one place to another or to um, change the usage of a building. And I think we, while I understand we have to look at the future and make sure we have money to do our street and transportation projects, I'm afraid that if we don't figure out what's causing that, this number to be so high, we're gonna lose businesses, businesses are gonna go someplace else, or they're not gonna come here at all. So what I'd like to propose is that we look at the specific things that are causing these overcharged fees and figure out why and how we, what we can do to change it since it can't really be changed at the staff level. Thank you for that, Denise. Um, anyone else, any other council committee reports or council business other than that? Okay, Elise. Uh, sorry, oh, go to Elise. I'm just gonna give my public health service announcement. Hold on, I'm gonna actually get on my phone. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. So, I just really want to say that um, I'm doing my very best to be as engaged as possible as I can with my committees and such. But I also just um, want to recognize that I'm not um, as engaged as I would hope to be at this moment. And um, it's just um, pretty much turning into a crisis at this point. And I do want to make just a public health service announcement that um, Providence alone this weekend saw um, more admissions to, to our hospitals in the Portland service area than we have um, in all of COVID combined. Um, we had over 80 admissions this weekend. And um, for those of you that don't know, I'm leading the virtual COVID team. So we do all the testing, um, all exposures, all contact tracing, um, resulting virtual care triage, all that stuff. So um, I think we're going, I'm going on, you know, I don't even know, day 31 in a row right now. So um, we've had 164 caregivers, I just looked, 164 caregivers test positive in the last two weeks. Um, and there's outbreaks happening in different um, hospitals. So um, for everyone that, you know, may be watching at home, complaining on Facebook that this isn't real, um, one thing I just want to make a make sure that everyone is aware of is even if COVID may not be that big of a deal to you, what ends up, what will end up happening is when our hospital capacity reaches um, bed capacity for COVID patients, um, our surgeries will get delayed. And, you know, those are cancer surgeries. Those are important surgeries. So um, we're already pulling back. If you saw the Oregonian over the weekend, all the major hospitals in Portland are pulling back elective surgeries. And you may think elective surgery means carpal tunnel. It actually also means cancer. So, um, you know, read your definitions of what um, insurance is used for um, classification, but this has a drastic impact on all of us and um, Newburgh's looking okay right now, but we have seen increases over the last <clears throat> couple weeks. Um, but and just a reminder for travel for Thanksgiving, you know, we're all gearing up that the next two months of our lives are pretty much going to be working straight. Um, but I would just really encourage everyone to not travel for Thanksgiving and to not congregate with people for Thanksgiving. Um, because the reality is that we have a huge testing shortage in Oregon right now. And um, our lab capacity was at 1700 per day uh, last week. And our allocation from um, the top two manufacturers in the country cut us down to 900 this week as we're surging. So, and this is not Providence specific, this is across the state and it's because the country's on fire and we don't have lab allocation that we need to actually um, test the amount we need. So we're at a 17% positivity rate in the Providence lab, which means we should be testing about, um, you know, 10 times more than we're actually able to do. So there's my uh, soapbox for the night, but um, not to scare anyone, but I just really, it's really disheartening to see um, 
how much public disinformation is happening around COVID. And I would just really encourage all of us to um, speak up to keep each other safe. I know that there's people on this call that are immunocompromised and we need to all do our part so that um, each other and our families can stay safe. Thank you, Elise. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, you and all of the folks that are doing the yeoman's work in this thing. You know, thank you so much, right? And Elise, the other thing is, hey, if if we can help share the load on any of your committees, any of that stuff, just just give a holler and we'll step up. There's there's we 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 all got time. We got more time than you do, certainly. So please do. You know, folks, again, underscore it. It is not, you know, again, wear a mask. Sorry, it's the only protocol we have. And the life it saves may be yours. So keep it in mind, right? Right? Uncovered faces you know, means potential death. So I don't, know how, I don't know how to say it more bluntly. Sorry, but there it is. All right, anybody, any, uh, anything else? Any other business for the good of the order? On a, on a, on a more sort of uplifting note, and, and this goes back to Project Oasis that Bryce mentioned earlier, and I know we heard about, um, I had the good fortune earlier last week to visit uh, DCI, actually, the folks at DCI, arranged a visit with the Gladstone Center for Children and Families. Um, super cool thing. It's in an old, I don't know if any of you have been there before. Super cool. It's in an old uh, like thrift way grocery store that they converted into this childcare slash early childhood sub for their community in Gladstone. So they have all of it there. They have preschool, they have Head Start. They've got the kindergarten from the school district. They've got all these services that people literally get there and the services are right there. And it was amazing and it was COVID, so there are no kids there, but it was still amazing. So this Project Oasis thing, and again, I was the one probably with more questions than anybody. I apologize to John Spencer and to Tim Murphy and everybody else, but the potential is really super cool. So uh, so there it is. Um, any Anything else? All right, the other thing I gotta say is, we were joking about the time we were gonna end. Don't, don't anybody think we're rushed. We're not trying to rush you, all of you all. We're not trying to, we, we're just trying to be efficient. So there you go. Um, otherwise, anybody got anything? Any parting words of wisdom for us? Anybody? I mean, sort of hard to top Elise's parting words of wisdom, honestly. So there you go, all right. All right, I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap. So everybody, keep doing all the good you do. Don't stop doing the good that you do, and uh, and we'll see you on December seventh, a day that will live in infamy. Right? Yep. Right. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Pearl Pearl Harbor, bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, a day that will live in infamy. Sorry, I I date myself, obviously, although I wasn't there at the time. Um, anyway, so I'll see you all. Have a have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.